morning. It's so good that we can gather on a beautiful morning like this to worship God together. People of all ages and stages of faith and life gathering in this place and online to worship Jesus this morning. I trust, I pray that in some hearts this morning there's a sense of anticipation of the joy of being able to meet together and of being able to meet with the Lord. May there be praise rising in us, hope stirring in our hearts as we sing. Would you stand? We're going to start with Hosanna. Praise is rising. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises Hosanna, Hosanna Come have your way among us We welcome you here, Lord Jesus of all our praises, Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus, we see you, we find strength to face the day, and in your presence, And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Because when we see you, because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Come have your way among us. We 
praise Jesus. Isn't it good to be able to worship him this morning and sing Hosanna, praises to his name. We turn our attention to Jesus, the King of Kings. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt From their tombs and the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come to the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born and the Spirit in the flame Now this gospel truth of all shall not kneel, shall not face By His blood and in His name, in His freedom I am for the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me.
worship you. And I worship you. Oh, we believe it. You are here. Healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. and he is a way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper, that light in the darkness. He is our saviour. He is our king. He is our Lord and we praise and we worship Jesus. We're going to invite Cornet now to come and lead us in communion as we in another way remember the goodness of our saviour. Thank you, Cornet. Good morning, everyone. Welcome here. Um, and as we gather here for communion, um, I just want to remind us, we often go back to the words of Jesus um, in the Bible, where he does the first communion, um, breaking the bread and sharing the cup. And in Matthew 26, 28, he says, this is my blood um, of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. For me, that always made sense because I grew up in a Christian home 
um, and went to church often, so I heard the words often for the forgiveness of sins. But then we learn more about the forgiveness of sin from the words of Jesus. And for the first time, I had a different perspective. At the age of 22, um, I went on a camp um, with a Christian group, or mostly a tour, to the Ukuvango Delta in Africa. And nature, God speaks to me often in nature, but there they had a talk on the Lord's Prayer. And I just want to read this, Matthew 6, verse 9 to 15. Um, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And that knocked me at that stage. Because at that stage, I was walking around with this anger in me, this resentment, this unforgiveness. And... They, they gave an opportunity that we can come and talk about if, if this challenged us. And that day, for the first time in my life, I faced the past. As a child, I was abused. And that day, for the first time, I faced my abusers before God. And I could go and say, God, this is for you. It's not mine anymore. I let down my anger, my resentment, my unforgiveness. And by doing that, I could invite God's forgiveness into my life. I could invite him in to bring his healing into my life. Because his grace is there for all of us, for you, for me, for everyone. If we allow him in, if we invite him in. So God's grace came in, and that's when my journey of life basically started, after forgiving. And it was just so wonderful to let go and let God, because he's the big healer. He's the big forgiver of sins. So soon we're going to share in communion. But before that, um, I, we're just going to pray, and I would like to invite you to today to just let go and let God lay down those things that's was done against you, but also the things that you've done, to lay that down in front of God. Because Jesus brought, he died for us on the cross. He shed his blood for us so we can be cleansed, so we can be clean, so we can walk without sin and carry that. So um, we're going to lay that down, take a few moments during the prayer and also later um, as we share communion. Let's pray. Holy Father, you are so much bigger than we can ever imagine. Thank you for your sacrifice on the cross, Lord Jesus, for your blood that was shed for us, for your body that was broken. So we do not have to carry the consequences of sin. Thank you for your love that's always with us. We praise you for that. Holy Father, we just want to bring this whole congregation and the people out there into your presence. Make them aware of your love. Make them lay down their burdens in front of you and bring your healing. We pray for the people that's sick in our congregation and also out here. Bring your healing over bodies also, over hearts that's broken, over lives that need you most. We pray for our ministry teams here. Thank you for your beautiful blessing and these beautiful people that's present in our life. We praise you today. Do your name the glory. Amen.
So I just want to invite you all. Um, we're going to have communion together while the next few songs is playing. Please come forward. There's two tables in the front, but there's also a table in the back. And in your own time, as you take the cup, as you take the cracker, um, just remember God, Jesus' body that was broken for you. And as you take the cup, remember Jesus' blood that was shed for you for forgiveness of sins. Thank you. Come forward in your own time.
Father, we want to thank you that you're here, that you're not far from any one of us, and that in you we live and move and have our very existence and being. And so, Father, we ask you to come and minister to those that are present in this room and those that will be watching in days to come. And we thank you, Spirit of God, that you can touch hearts, men lives, and we ask that right now together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Young people, one way. Children, teenagers, good time to exit. If you've got a Bible, come with me as we uh, look at conversations. Uh, today is the third in our series of Life Shapes. And we're going to look at the conversational square. And if Jesus is our model and our, uh, the one that we're following, let's have a look at how he gets into deeper conversations with people. John 4, and if you've got a Bible or a phone or an iPad, come with me as we go to the city of Sychar or the city of drunkenness. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Drunken, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to the son, uh, his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food, and the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have given him, and he would have, uh, you, would, uh, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. 
Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this running water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become a well in him, uh, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see you, that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this Mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Mike Breen uh, said, in the past hundred years, we've entered into a new image-based culture. We store large amounts of information, stories and data by attaching them to images. Our brains are literally wired differently than they were a hundred years ago. The idea of attaching the teachings of Jesus and scripture to a few basic images is perfectly in line with how our brains are already hardwired. We live in a visual generation. And so we've begun our journey of looking at life shapes that describe the journey of discipleship. Uh, we've looked at uh, the fact that discipleship is more than belonging to a denomination. In fact, uh, one in seven uh, change uh, churches every year. One in six are going to multiple churches every year. And one in two are no longer in the church that they started with. The world is changing. We're looking for the magic bullet. And the magic bullet is not denominations. The magic bullet is being a lifelong follower of Jesus, a, a disciple, learning the words and works and ways of Jesus. And so today we're going to push a little bit further into that journey. We've looked at the balance that we need, that threefold relationship of, of being up with the Father, being in community with other believers and being outward focused in our mission to the world. We've Last week we explored what it is to work from rest, getting the rhythm that God designed in creation and by his command about getting a sense of rhythm and beat to our approach to life. And today we want to dig a bit deeper into the conversational square. Uh, someone has said that Christians are normally too much or too little. We're either too much cha challenge, we start our conversations with, are you born again? Are you saved? Are you a Christian? Are you going to hell? That's a bit heavy to start as an opening line. Or maybe we're too little. Maybe there's nothing, no bullets in the chamber at all. We've got no idea where this is going and whether we want it to go anywhere. But I think from our readings, we're looking at the fact that for Jesus, people were never projects, never targets. There are always people that were deeply loved by God. 
And so uh, I'd like us just for a few moments to just sit and soak in the story of Jesus, this conversationalist, Jesus the conversationalist, and see if there aren't some things that if we truly care about people, there are at least some principles that we can adopt in uh, talking to people. Billy Graham talks about some of his conversational failures. He went to a real small town, asked a boy for directions to the post office. After getting them, Graham said, uh, would you come to the crusade? I'm telling people how to get to heaven. The boy said, I don't think so. I don't think I'll be there. You don't even know the way to the post office. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I've had plenty of uh, conversational failures. Uh, but thankfully, Jesus, I think, uh, gives us some direction. Jesus is the question man, not the answer man. Jesus was asked 307 questions in the gospel. Jesus asked 183 questions and he only ever answered three. You see, I think for many Christians, full stop, we feel we have to have the what? The answers, when really we need to have the questions. We need to uh, be open to giving better questions and stop giving better explanations, to start listening to where people are when we say Jesus is the answer, most people today would say, well, what's the question? We need to listen to the questions they're asking and not target everyone, but be led to specific people. So I want to ask you, uh, have you popped the question? Do you know who your pop is? Who is that specific person? Who is your pop? The person that's hiding in plain sight right in front of you. POP is a, an acronym for person of peace. Jesus said to his disciples, I want you to open your eyes. Have a look around. They're all around you. They're hiding in plain sight. They're people and persons of peace. I want you to learn to see, not everyone, but to see the specific person that God is leading you to. In Luke 10, it says, when you enter a house, First say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there with that person of peace, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Don't move around from house to house. You need to recognize who is listening to you, who likes you, who's leaning in towards you, Who's generous with you? Who wants to serve you? That probably is your person of peace. Jesus said, I tell you, open your eyes, look at the fields. They're all out there. They are ripe for harvest. The problem is not that there are people not searching for the kingdom of God. The problem is that we as the harvesters can't see the harvest. And so Jesus had to go to the village of drunkenness or Sychar because he had a divine appointment. And when John's Gospel uses the word, he had to go. It's because he had a specific person that God was drawing his attention to. And so who is your person of peace? I can think of people in my world who like me, who listen to me, who serve me who are generous with me, who invite me to barbecues, who want to spend time with me. They're your person of peace. And not only was there a woman who was this person of peace, but many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to what? Stay with us. And he stayed how many? Two more days, and, he became, and, and because of his words, many more became believers. The two-hour pit stop became a two-day party because this was the entry person into other persons of peace. If we're really going to follow the ways of Jesus, then it's not about using a shotgun to blast everybody. 
It's about finding who is that one person that God is drawing my attention to that I need to just push a little bit further into just to see what God is saying. And so the person of peace is the one who listens, who likes and who serves you. You need to watch out for them. Jesus has just spoken with Nicodemus from the religious community who's leaning into him. And now in John 4, he's talking to someone who's definitely outside of the religious community, but is also leaning, and Jesus could see it. And so let's take our journey on the conversational square. How do we care for people in a way that doesn't manipulate them, but genuinely cares for people, converses, asks deeper questions, ready for spiritual openings, and who encourages discovery of, of Jesus. Many times in the Gospel we read these words that the Son of Man, Jesus, came eating and drinking. He went to the barbecues, the parties, the breakups, and the religious people said, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors, and sinners, but Jesus says, but wisdom is proved right by her deeds. You see, uh, you need to ask the question who is inviting me into their world? And you can do that, you can go into that uh, encounter. And so here's the first thing as we move around the square that I think are principles from the conversations of Jesus. The first one is learning to communicate or converse. A woman went to a judge about her divorce. The judge said, do you have any grounds? She said, just two acres. Not that, that's not what I don't, uh, I don't mean that, said the judge. Do you have a grudge? No, we park our car in the front of the house. The judge is now getting frustrated, so he says, does your husband beat you up? No, I get up before he gets up. <laughs> then why do you want a divorce? because we just don't seem to be able to communicate. I don't know about you, but uh, the reason why communication is such a difficult thing is because 7% is actually the words. 38% is the tone in which those words deliver, and 55% is the visual assessment of the messenger. And so it's probably more likely today that... Uh, You'll remember my shirt, not my sermon. You'll remember the stories, not the points. You'll remember the pictures, not the presenter. And so we are a visual generation. Uh, Roger Allies uh, from Fox News says, you are the message. What does that mean exactly? It means that when you communicate with someone, it's not just the words you choose to send to the other person that make up the message you're sending signals about what kind of person you are. And if communication is 93% who you are and 7% the words, then what do we need to kind of bring into the sphere of our attention is, do we really genuinely love that person? Can they see authenticity in your eyes? Do they hear compassion in the tone of your voice so that the words actually register? Notice how Jesus, on another occasion, these principles seem to be much clearer. Jesus looked at him, good eye contact, face to face, and he loved him. The communication is now going more than just the visual there is that visceral, there is that vocal tone to his voice that communicates love. And then the four words, one thing you lack. I'll tell you how that story ends a little bit later. So when Humphrey Bogart in 1942 in Casablanca says, here's looking at you, kid, he was actually on the money. Because it is the nonverbals that people remember. The Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. You're jumping racial, religious groups to get to me. How can you ask me for a drink? 
Jews were told they couldn't use a cup or a knife or fork or plate that a Samaritan had touched. Jesus, you're asking me for me to give you my cup so that you can have a drink. You're crossing gender, social, moral barriers to reach out to me. Why would you do that? Right now she's eyeballing Jesus and asking the question, what's happening in this conversation? And Jesus now pushes into that conversation, if you knew the gift of God, what it is, and if you knew who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him for that gift and he would have given you living water. You see, the word living had a kind of double meaning. In the ancient world, if a water was uh, static, it was dead water, but if it was moving, it was living water. So you've got your own spring, your kind of uh, a little soak in the backyard that's bubbling out. And so he's got her attention. I don't know if you ever thought about water, but you and I are literally water balloons. We're two-thirds water. Do you know that? You know when you hold that water balloon, that's what you look like because you're mostly water held together by a bit of skin and skeleton. But we're mostly liquid. By the time you're 70 years of age, you would have had 8 million litres of water to keep you going. If you lose 2% of your water, your energy decreases by 20%. If you lose 10% of your water, you can't walk. If you lose 20% of your water, you're dead. You and I are water. And this woman has been going back and forth, back and forth for physical water to have her 8 million litres of water in a lifetime. And Jesus says, listen, there's much more than a physical drink. The water I give will be an artesian spring within Gushing fountains of endless life, says Jesus. And suddenly the conversation is moving from a simple request to much deeper issues. This person of peace is starting to open up and Jesus is starting to push in. What a strange thing for a Jew to do with a Samaritan woman. The strict rabbis of Jesus' time would never greet a woman in public. They wouldn't even speak to his own wife or daughter or sister in public. The Pharisees were called the bruised and bleeding Pharisees because if they saw a woman, they closed their eyes and kept walking and often banged into walls and lampposts. Rather than engage a woman in sight and compassion. And so here is Jesus communicating and asking deeper questions. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living, flowing, running water? Indeed, the water I give them will become in them, says Jesus, a spring of life welling up to eternal life. But now I want you to go call your husband and come back. It's a normal thing to do rather than talk to a woman in isolation to bring the husband in. But Jesus is pushing in to the moral dimension in this woman's life. She's had five husbands. She's living with another man. And Jesus says, you're right, you don't have a husband. You don't understand the nature of marriage. But you're a soul in search of love. And you're not going to find it in another person. You're only going to find it in the God who is the true lover, the true husband of every heart. A beautiful soul that now Jesus sees is ready for a spiritual encounter. He's communicated, he's pushed in, and now comes a spiritual moment. I don't know about you, do you get nervous about these sort of conversations? A Christian barber got really nervous. He heard a sermon on Sunday, thought, Monday morning, I'm just going to do it. I'm the first man in the door, he's going to get it. And so the man, first man, came in and said, I want to shave. The man was shocked, ran out to the back and prayed, God, the first customer has come in. I'm, I am going to witness to him, so give me the wisdom to know just the right thing to say to him. Amen. So he went out, got his Bible, 
got his razor and he said, I've only got one question for you, are you ready to die? <laughs> I'm not sure that was an answer to prayer and I'm not sure if the man came to faith. But the woman said, Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. The Jew Jews believe that one of the essential characteristics of Messiah would be that he would be able to tell the secrets of all hearts. The Jews were waiting for a man who would bring revelation. Isaiah 11, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge. And of the fear of God. Sir, I can see that you maybe are this prophet. And if that was what the Jews believed, it was most likely that the Samaritans believed the same thing. That when Messiah would come, he would bring the disclosure of secrets. But then she moved on because they were standing near uh, Mount uh, uh, Gerizim. Gerizim and Ebel were the two mountains where Moses said, I want you to get on Gerizim and shout blessings and then I want you to climb up on Ebel and shout curses on disobedience, blessings on obedience. And she said, we're on the mountain of blessing. We're at the place where Jacob put his feet. We're at the place where Joseph's sons drank. We're just as much in the religious heritage as you are. And Jesus responds, Neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem that true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the tr kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. It's not a matter of geography. It's a matter of personality. It's where is your heart focused? Are you worshipping sincerely and truthfully? Are you worshipping in the spirit and in the truth of the word of God, the spirit of God and the word of God? Are you worshipping genuinely, sincerely and honestly and truthfully? Matt Redman was part of a, a Christian worship band in Britain uh, and the pastor confronted the band about an issue. They were proud about their musical performance but they were neglecting true worship and as a result of that pastoral con uh, conversation, everyone left, bar Matt Redman. He sat down and he wrote this song, I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. True worship. It's not about the building. It's not about the performance, it's about the person of Jesus who's actually here right now. He's sitting with you. He's leaning into you. And he's saying, can we do business? Can we go deeper? Can we push in a little bit further? A conversational square is about learning to converse. It's about asking deeper questions. It's about being ready for spiritual openings, but it's encouraging discovery. You know, the Samaritans in their uh, uh, Day of Atonement liturgy about the Messiah, they said, water shall flow from his buckets. Water shall flow from his buckets, based on Numbers 24, 7 and 17. In the Old Testament, the Samaritans only acknowledged the first five books of the Old Testament. But in there was this promise. Water will flow from his buckets. I see him, but not now. I, I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel. They were waiting for Messiah. This one who would bring revelation. This one who would pour water into thirsty lives. She said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming and when he comes, we know as Samaritans he will explain everything to us. 
And Jesus makes the declaration, I, the one, speaking to you, I am he. You see, I think there comes a choice in every conversation, ultimately, to this point. What will you do with that information? Will you come further into the light or will you push back into the darkness? Will you drink from living water or will you die of thirst? You know, there is a whole generation that are spiritually dead. They're thirsty. And it's only Jesus that can make the difference. Did it make a difference? Well, the woman, what did she leave? Then leaving her, say it with me, water jar. She'd just come a kilometre and a half out of town with her jar of water to collect water and now she leaves it because she's discovered that there's something bigger than physical water. And she went back into the town. The disciples now join the conversation. They've got the takeaway. Rabbi, eat something. And he says, no, listen, guys, I don't need it. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. A woman discovers water and Jesus discovers food. Do you want to know what the most exciting thing in the Christian life is? When you, not me, when you discover the adventure of having fun with God, of seeing where conversations go, that is energising. That is true water. That is true food. When you get to prove the reality of God for yourself, that's exciting. Jesus said, you can keep the Uber Eats, guys. I've just had a fill. I've just had a feast with what God's up to. And so she goes back into town, come see a man who knew all about the things I did, who knows me inside and out. Do you think this one could be the Messiah? And not only does she come back, but the town starts to trickle out. Certainly the five previous husbands are trickling out. Others are joining. This woman is well known. And they said after two days, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the saviour, not of Jews, not of Samaritans, but he's the saviour of what? The Messiah has come and the world can receive him. You see, the harvest is ready. Let no one hang back. The harvest will not wait. And so here we follow Jesus around the conversational square, learning to start the conversation, learning what it is to ask deeper questions, seeing in this pop, this person of peace, someone who may be ready for more spiritual engagement so that we can encourage a personal discovery. This woman made the discovery. She heard God for herself. She turned around, went back to her network and she told everyone she crossed the line. Let me ask you, have you ever crossed the line of faith? Have you come to that place where you've discovered that Jesus truly is Messiah for yourself and you've begun the most exciting journey that anyone could ever make in life is to to take the companionship of Jesus and to live in the moment with him. The fun of not blasting our way through life, but just being led by God to the people that God has selected in our world. You know, there's a little group that are just exploring this one question. When they get people to the place of discovery, they're saying, I'm looking for someone to read the Bible with me and I don't know if you'd be interested. When they ask that question with people of peace, they find that one in three say, yes, I'd like to read the Bible with you. And that church currently is growing at about 10% per annum, multiplying into different cultural groups as people hear God for themselves, do something about it and take it to their friends. They're having fun discovering what God is up to. And they only give them three questions. What did God 
say to you, what are you going to do with it? And who are you going to tell? What did God say? What are you going to do? And who are you going to tell? And somehow God, the Spirit of God, is at work in Australia in a way that we would think impossible. But if one in three say yes, then that means two in three say no. I don't, I'm not interested at this point in reading further. So what happened to the man that Jesus looked at with love? Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, come and follow me. And at this the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. You know, there are people who are leaning in to you. They're listening to you. Some of those are going to go further into faith. Others are going to stall and some are going to say no and turn away. I don't know if you recognise the face. Uh, it's probably only a generation that know who he is. Anybody know who this man is? Okay, can I hear it again up the back? Who do you reckon he is? John Wayne. For those who uh, lived in the 20th century, he was the biggest character, the biggest actor of the screen right through the majority of the 20th century. Uh, but John Wayne uh, was a big fan of Dr. Robert Shuler, the preacher who was online and uh, from the Crystal Cathedral. He was a man of seeing the possibilities of faith. And John Wayne was a big fan. And one day he heard that Robert Shuler's daughter, teenage daughter, was in a motorbike accident and had her leg amputated. And it touched him. And so while Cindy was in hospital recovering from an amputation, John Wayne wrote a personal note. Dear Cindy, sorry to hear about your accident. Hope you will be all right, John Wayne. You see, he was listening. He was leaning. He liked Robert and he was leaning in to that family. And so immediately she got a pen and wrote this back to John Wayne. Dear Mr Wayne, I got your note. Thanks for writing to me. I like you very much and I'm going to be all right because Jesus is going to help me. Mr Wayne, do you know Jesus? I sure hope you know Jesus, Mr Wayne, because I cannot imagine heaven being complete without John Wayne being there. I hope, if you don't know Jesus, that you will give your heart to Jesus right now. See you in heaven. Cindy. She wrote the note, put it in an envelope, and wrote on the front of the envelope, John Wayne. And just then a man walks into her hospital room and asks, what are you doing? And she told him the story, John wrote me a letter, and I've written him a letter back, but I don't know how to get it to him. She said, you know, that's a strange thing because I'm going to have dinner with John Wayne tonight and put the envelope into its pocket. She said, he, the person said, I'm going to have dinner, Newport Beach, I'll give. So there the letter sat, but he forgot about the letter. And as they were laughing and eating their way through an incredible meal, having a lot of fun, then the man reached into his pocket and remembered the letter. And so he passed it down the table. Hey, Duke, hey, I was in Shula's daughter's room today and she wrote you a letter and wanted me to give it to you. Here it is. They passed it down the table. He opened it. They kept on talking and laughing. But as they watched him read the letter, they began to see him cry. Hey, Duke, what's the matter? He called the table to attention and said, I want to read you this letter. He read the table, the letter. And then he began to weep, put it back in his pocket. He said to the man who delivered the letter, you go tell that little girl that right now in this restaurant right here, John Wayne gives his heart to Jesus Christ and I will see her in heaven. And three weeks later, John Wayne died. His son and his grandson testify to his faith, that he came to a genuine faith in Jesus. 
a person of peace leaning in to Robert Schuller, writing a note and that family sending back a communication and encouraged a moment of discovery of faith. You know what touches me about that story is not only does God want John Wayne in heaven and the Duke's going to be there, guys, is he wants you in heaven. Just as he knows John's name, he knows your name. And he knows the name of everyone who listens to this moment. And he wants you in heaven. Heaven is not complete without you. Without the Samaritan woman, without her five past husbands, without the people in that village, heaven is not complete. Without the members of your family, heaven is not complete. And so will you care enough like Jesus to start the journey of conversation, of looking for moments when they bring revelation that you can ask deeper questions? Will you be ready to seed some spirituality into those conversations and to ask the most important question, will you give your heart to Jesus? Would you bow with me in prayer? Before we sing our final song, as a believer, are you up for following the ways and words and works of Jesus? It's a lot of fun. It's, a, it's much better than being a denomination. It's being a disciple. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you that the fields are truly white. And that the food that keeps us going is to do the will of the one who sent us, finishing the work, to look around right now and to see the harvest. Father, this week, would you just open our eyes to that man, that woman, that young person who's leaning in and listening, who likes us, who's generous with us and who is leaning into the very presence of God. If only we could see it. Lord, uh, help us to be able to reach a wide range of people, to enter their world, to understand their point of view, and to lead them into a God saved life. Lord Jesus, thank you that your ways are easy and your burden is light. Father, we hand over all of the things we thought discipleship and evangelism were and we receive from you afresh what it is to walk in the very steps of Jesus. And now the grace of Jesus, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be our experience this week. Amen. stand together as we sing. Our God is worthy when we want to build our life on His ways, on His words and His works. Let's just praise Him. And let Him lead us to those around us. Okay. Worthy of every song we could ever sing.
focusing on Jesus, the ways, the works, the words of Jesus, that he would lead us in his love to those around us. Lord, may we know that person of peace. May we move around that square in our conversations going deeper that people might come to know you and your love. Amen. So good that you were here this morning. Tonight, Haley and Rachel, uh, two of our high school students here, grade 12, are leading tonight with Ellie and Eggie, leading our worship tonight. Come back tonight, join with our youth band. Uh, if you're able to be here tonight, invite friends along that they might share with us. And may God bless you. There is coffee, tea and fellowship time to share just now.